It's my pleasure to welcome you to Answers from Scripture. Whether you're just being introduced to the Bible for the first time or you've been studying it for a lifetime, I'm confident that you'll benefit from Brother Mark's passionate explanations for the Word of God. Hey friends, welcome to Answers for Scripture. I'm your host, Brother Mark. And we've got a good topic for you today, and it's one that's very relevant. We have so many problems in our society, so many changes due to gender dysphoria, uh, this, this new society. They're trying to experiment with our children, and they're mocking, very openly mocking the nuclear family, and especially mocking traditional gender roles. And they're calling us sexist. If you believe in anything like a biblical family or traditional gender roles, you're being called sexist. So the question is, are traditional gender roles sexist? And, I, and I've been thinking a lot about this lately, and, and I marvel as the third wave of the feminist movement seems to take its clutches on our country. And their mantra is a hatred of masculinity. That's what they claim. They, they blame nearly every problem in the world on masculinity. And yet, have you ever met a feminine feminist? The very thing that they claim to hate, this masculinity that, that they blame for every problem in the world, is what they then emulate and they become masculine. And it's all a rebellion against biblical norms, against God's plan when he created them male and female. So I'm going to give two points primarily about these traditional gender roles, especially the concept of the man as the head of the home. And we're going to find both of them in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says in verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. And that's got to be a shocker in today's day and age. When it comes here to this it's talking about the apostles, it's talking about the preachers, it's talking about speaking publicly, it's talking about how we behave in church, it's talking about preaching and proclaiming and bringing spiritual truth. And it says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. Now she is allowed to teach, she's allowed the older women teach the younger women and the children, the Bible says, how to love their husbands, how to love their children. The Bible talks about them in this teaching role. But when it comes to the public church service, they're learning in silence. And it says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. He repeats it again a second time. And then he gives reason number one. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. The order of creation demonstrates that God chose man as the leader by design. And that concept of design is very important. Now I want you to think about this. What if no one was in charge? What would that look like? Uh, That would be bad news. What if everyone was in charge? Uh, That would be bad news. So God had to choose someone to be in charge, correct? Can, can we agree with that, that God had to, to have any kind of orderly society, God had to choose someone to be in charge. So what makes sense to us? Let's say God said uh, the smartest one in the marriage should be in charge. Do you think there may sometimes be an argument over who's the smartest one? Or the strongest one should be in charge. Could there ever be an argument over who's the strongest one? But that's not the way it works. And you look, let's say I've been driving too fast and I'm pulled over by a police officer. He may be stronger than I am or I may be stronger than he is. He may be smarter than I am or I might be smarter than he is. But that's not the issue. It's not an issue of equality, who's worth more. It's not an issue of strengths and talents and ability, who's, uh, who knows more. It's who has the authority. And in that situation, the state has given the authority to the law enforcement officer over my traffic infraction. Okay, God said, I'm gonna make a choice and God chose the man. Now you might think God made a good choice. You might think God made a 
a bad choice. And we're going to show you something a little bit later, I think surprising. But God, in simply making that choice, wasn't making a statement of inequality. I believe the Bible, more than any other book of religion, honors women and shows an equality in value. For example, in Galatians, when it's talking about salvation, in this, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Every ethnicity is saved the same way. In this, the Bible says, there's neither male nor female. Of what is he speaking specifically? Of salvation. Salvation is what God paid for you. Now think about that. Follow, track with me a little bit. Is God, does God believe in equal value of all humankind? I believe he does. What did God pay? What price did God pay for me so that I could be saved? Uh, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, what price did he pay for my wife so that she could be saved? The blood of his son, Jesus Christ. No difference. So there's an equality of value. But equality of value doesn't always mean the same design or the same purpose in life. I want you to think about this. Say I went to the hardware store and I paid $15 for a hammer. And I also paid $15 for a handsaw. Which one's worth more? Well, it depends what I'm trying to do. But obviously, I believe they're both worth $15. I was willing to pay $15. So I believe in an equality of value between the handsaw and the hammer, no difference. But not an equality in design. They're made differently. I want you to think with me for a minute. Could I take a long board and make it into two short boards using a hammer? Yes, I could, but it wouldn't be pretty. Could I take a nail and drive it into a piece of wood using a handsaw? I might be able to do that, but it would be pretty stupid of me. Oh, so you don't believe in the quality of the tools. I paid $15 for both of them. I believe they're wor worth the same in value, but they had a different design. And I believe that male and female are worth the same to God in value. Otherwise, he wouldn't have paid the same price for them on the cross. But clearly, they had a different design. And God showed that in making first the male and first the female. You think of birth order in a family. I happen to be born into a family where the firstborn was a daughter. And I followed her. So when mom and dad had to leave the house for a little while, guess who was babysitting whom? Uh, my sister was babysitting me. Why? Because she came first. And she had the greater experience and the longer life there. And by design, it just kind of set it up that way that the firstborn, a lot of times, has some authority over the secondborn. And God said, when I made Adam first and then Eve instead of the other way around, I was showing something by design. I gave information to Adam, and then Adam had the responsibility to pass that information down to his wife. And that left him in charge. And that's what it says. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. But it isn't just a question of difference in design. There's also another matter that he discusses here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So we learn something about why God put the man in charge of the woman in creation and the order of creation. We also learn something about why God put man in charge of the woman when it comes to the fall of man. Now, what is it that we learn from the fall of man? Turn to Genesis chapter 3. I wish I had an hour for this one subject, but I'm going to take just a few minutes, if at all possible, if I can do it that quickly. But Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 by the way, 3.16 is an important verse in so many books of the Bible. It's very interesting. But Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, here's where God is reproving Eve for her portion of the fall. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And so that's the first part of the curse on the woman, that there's going to be an increase in the sorrow and the pain of bringing children 
into the world. But notice the next thing it says. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now what does that, that phrase mean? Thy desire shall be unto thy husband. Does that mean just automatically every woman that's ever going to live is going to have a natural love and desire for her husband? Is going to find her husband desirable at every moment of the day? Not at all. That's not what it means. Uh, and we know in reality that that's not the case, that, that our wives always desire us and find us desirable and automatically love us. They never have to be taught to love us. It's just automatic. No. So how can I know what this phrase means? Well, amazingly, God uses almost the exact same phraseology in the very next chapter when he's personifying sin and he's talking to Cain. So in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, now Cain has killed his brother Abel. And God is talking to Cain. He says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now he's personifying sin. You sinned, you gave in to sin, and now it's right there at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. Sin is going to desire thee. And thou shalt rule over him. But you better rule over him, Cain. And what God's saying is now that you've given in to sin once, you've complied to her wishes, you've decided to do it her way, now sin is going to have a desire to continue in that relationship. If any man sin, he's going to be a servant of sin, right? And once you give in to sin once, sin now has the desire to be the ruler. But he's saying, Cain, don't let sin rule over you. You rule over sin. Now you've given up, you've given in once, you've complied with sin, and now there's this new sense of relationship that instead of you controlling it, it's going to control you. But I don't want you to live that way. I want you to control your sin. And by the way, you young men filled with testosterone, you want to go out there and prove you can lord over something, control something, start with that. Start with your sin. Sin's trying to rule over you. You say, I'm not going to let it. With God's help, I'm going to take control of my sin. And you prove your ability to have authority in that realm. But it's the same phraseology. What does it mean? Before, the man was made first and the woman. And the man was telling the woman what God had told him. And it was just the natural order of things. Now, for the first time, that natural order got switched. She told Adam what to do. And now it felt good. And now she had a new desire. What was that new desire? To tell him what to do. But he shall rule over thee. He better not give in to that desire. Now, from that lesson, I want you to understand something. And this is going to be hard, hard, especially for the women to believe. Not the first part, but the second part. The first part, every woman today by nature has it in her heart. There's something in her nature that she wants to manipulate a man. She wants to tell a man what to do. And she wants to take charge. And God says, you can't do that. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. But every man in his nature wants to just give in and do what his wife says, like Adam did. Think about this. Eve didn't even understand. She didn't even perceive fully that what she was doing was wrong. At first she had doubt, and she said to Satan, no, we're not supposed to eat it, not even supposed to touch it. But she was deceived, and she was convinced it's not that bad. Adam knew what she had done was wrong, and he still gave in. Now, this is what you women don't understand about the nature of man. But nine times out of ten, the man would rather just do what his wife says and not have all the drama. Oh, he might want to take charge on the football field. He might want to take charge in the battlefield. He might want to take charge in the workplace. But when he comes home, his motto is go along to get along. Happy wife is a happy life. Whatever she wants, I'm going to give her because I don't want the drama. And so God said, I'm going to make both of you, I'm going to force both of you to fight against your human nature. Her human nature wants her to take charge when that wasn't my design for her. And she's going to have to fight that. 
And his human nature is just to give in and let her. But that's not the design I had for him. So both the man and the woman are going to have to fight against their natural tendencies. And it's going to force both of them to depend on God. The wife has to depend on God more for a willingness just to give in and submit. By the way, they both have their areas of leadership. The Bible doesn't say children obey your fathers in the Lord for this is right. The Bible says children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. The wife is the keeper at home. That doesn't just mean she stays home. The zookeeper runs the zoo. Yeah? And the keeper at home, she, she has a lot of authority there in that home, naturally. We understand that. You look at the Proverbs 31 woman, and she's, she's going to do the shopping because she's good at that. And she's going to pick their clothes because she's better at that. And she's sometimes even going to travel, maybe find a piece of land that they can use so they can garden on their own or save some money. They're good at that. And men, let them do the things they're good at doing. Give them that space and, and allow them to have their own realm and their own kingdom. But when it comes to the spiritual leadership of the home and teaching the family what God says and giving direction to the family for what God says, even though the wife's going to want to say, well, I like this church better. And even though the man's going to just say, Yes, dear, whatever you say, dear, God says, I want you both to fight against that natural tendency. I made man first for a reason. You both have the same value, but not the same design. And ma'am, I'm going to make you fight against your natural desire, the desire for him to have him under you in authority. And I'm going to have the man fight against his natural desire just to give in and do whatever she says even when he knows it's wrong. And so by design and because of the deception of the fall, in creation and in the fall, we see God's choice for these traditional gender roles has nothing about who's more valuable, has nothing about toxic masculinity. It's about common sense. Somebody's got to be in charge and God designed for the man to do it even though the average man would rather walk away from it. Let's help each other in our marriage. Let's, let's help the other do what God tells us to do instead of what our natural instinct and our natural tendency, the desires that we have in our flesh are telling us to do. Shall we? And I think Christians could really, really through their testimony be light in this darkening world. I hope that helps you. God bless you. You have a great day. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a question you'd like to have answered, mention it in the comments field below or visit us at www.answersfromscripture.online.